and we've had a wonderful time so far and we have much more to, to do here, so thank you very, very much. So uh, here we go on uh, acute compartment syndromes in children. Um, compartment syndrome is a low-tech diagnosis, which means that you don't need all the pressure measurements that I'm going to talk about. You need a basic understanding of what it is, the anatomy, and, and, a good, and then do a good physical examination on the patient to make the diagnosis and then prov provide uh, treatment. And to start with, you have to have a compartment. And we have lots of compartments throughout the body. The classics, of course, are in the forearm and the leg. And with these compartments and trauma, uh, you get increased fluid pressure, which eventually uh, cuts off the circulation to the muscles and nerves with, that go in those compartments that give you the end result of a Volkmann's contracture if left to its natural history. In the forearm, we have the three compartments, the volar compartment, the mobile wad, and the dorsal compartment. In the leg, we have four compartments. We have the anterior compartment with its nerve, the deep perineal nerve. We have the lateral compartment with the superficial perineal nerve, which lies right in that septum between the anterior and lateral. Uh, we have the sural nerve in the superficial posterior compartment and the tibial nerve in the deep posterior compartment. Leading causes of a compartment syndrome are fractures, upper and lower extremity, contusions without fractures, such as a kick in the shin playing soccer arterial injuries, drug overdose or limb compression from uh, earthquakes, and uh, the final one was burns, which is very common, is certainly in the, in the plastic surgery realm. Forearm fractures produce it, supracondylar fractures produce it, less so now because of the uh, tendency not to do this hyperflexion cast anymore which was uh, associated with a Volkmann's contracture in many kids, and this is from our series that we did uh, when I was a, a, a fellow in Toronto. They had other causes such as tibia fractures, femoral fractures that were treated in traction, as pictured. The incidence with tibia fractures in adults runs somewhere between three and five percent, but with open tibia fractures in a series of a 200 here, it can run up to eight percent. So open fractures in the tibia have a higher incidence because of increased trauma. So beware of that. An open fracture doesn't get you off the hook. Arterial injuries associated with compartment syndrome uh, push the limb into a double jeopardy. First, they have ischemia from the arterial injury, then repair, either removal of the clot or repair of the torn artery, and then you get uh, post-ischemic swelling in the limb which adds to the hours of ischemia if a prophylactic fasciotomy is not done at the same time of the repair. And any time you get over four hours of arterial occlusion, you will get a compartment syndrome to follow. All of these things, all of these traumas, whatever they are, uh, cause fluid to accumulate in these closed spaces. Edema fluid, hemorrhage. This causes rising compartment pressure eventually compartment tamponade, which leads to the death of the muscle and the nerves that are in that compartment. And then more edema uh, because of the decreased blood flow. And left to its natural course, you end up with permanent nerve damage, muscle infarction, and a Volkmann's contracture. Now, what are the clinical findings? Well, after you have an injury, in most cases, it's in, our, in our field, it's trauma and it's a fracture. And there's usually a lag phase of six to eight hours between the initiation of the trauma, the bleeding into the compartment, and then the rising pressure. Now you can have the pressure jump right away if, you, if with the trauma you have a torn artery and it's pumping into the compartment and raises the pressure, but that's, a, that's an unusual. And you can also have a delay where you do the fracture reduction of an IM rod the, and the next day and, and that causes the compartment syndrome. So it's, this is a general statement. Somewhere in our experience, six to eight hours on a routine case, uh, the pressure will rise enough to produce a compartment syndrome. And what that pressure, we think, is around 30 millimeters of mercury. Because at that time, the pressure is significant enough that you start to see the symptoms, if you monitor these patients, of starting to have pain, starting to have paresis weakness, starting to have paresthesias in their limb, which go on to anesthesia left to the natural course and paralysis left to the natural course. Gradually that pressure will come back down 
Usually it takes about a week if you follow the natural history of these, and then you'll end up with the residuals of a Volkmann's contracture. So this is sort of the, the curve that I think happens with an untreated compartment syndrome. Now I think the key to diagnosis is evaluation of the, of the patient's sensation. And this requires an accurate exam, and you have to define which nerves are involved and explain any nerve deficit that you have in your patients. I think two-point discrimination is the best, it's the most accurate, but in children sometimes you can't do that. Most kids you can train uh, how to do the, the two-point discrimination. Light touch is okay as a starting point, but don't do this test with their eyes open. Every child will tell you, and I see it all the time with my residents when they go to examine the patient, they show me how they're examined, the kid's looking right at him, and he'll say yes every time to that, that little test. So you have to find out if you have a reliable witness. And you start with uh, checking to see if they understand the game on their uninjured side. Do they respond when you touch appropriately to the various autonomy zones of the hand uh, on the uninjured side before you move to the injured side? And then again, you check the, the distribution of the nerves to be sure that they're all functioning. Uh, if they don't cooperate decently on the first uninjured side, then the sensation's not gonna be a, a good value to you. Now kids under three, this is almost impossible as far as, you can look at the motor function, watch some digits move. Sensation is really not gonna be very valuable and, and, in, and it's gonna be inaccurate. Uh, sometimes you may, if you have a worrisome patient with a lot of swelling, you actually may have to blindfold them or hide and take out a little needle and stick to see if, if they are anesthetic. Uh, particularly if you have a supraconal fracture, because a median nerve out with a supraconal fracture is a very dangerous situation because you, you won't have, uh, you already have a sensory deficit and you won't be able to find a change. So it's very important. And later on, a week later, you'll find lack of moisture in that child's and you, you'll know which nerves are injured uh, in that particular episode. Uh, you need to know the distribution of the nerves uh, and, and where they go and because knowing which nerves are out and again with them blindfolded, you can track which nerves are out and then figure out which compartments are involved. Pain with stretch. Everybody, pain out of proportion, pain with stretch. Those, that's what you see in the literature. But be careful with that because pain with stretch will go away once the nerve is out or if they come in with the nerve out, such as in a supraconder with the median nerve out. That is gone, that, is, that doesn't help you. And plus everybody's pain threshold is different. You don't know, you have some patients have a forearm fracture and they just are jumping through the window with pain and others are very stoic and, and don't have hardly any pain with the same fracture. Also in the literature, including very recently, there are articles saying pulselessness. That is not a finding of a compartment syndrome. That is a finding of an arterial injury. Pulses and capillary fill are generally intact with a compartment syndrome. And that is because the pressure builds up, it cuts off the circulation to these little capillaries and arterioles, but leaves the main tube open. The main river is open to the hand. So the hand will actually be pinker than normal because it's, it's, it's having a blood flow there and shunting from the muscle. And the artery, if you can feel it, because sometimes there's edema and you can't, and you may need a Doppler, but it should be working. Unless you, of course, have a joint injury with, uh, with a, an arterial injury from the supracondylar plus the compartment syndrome. So my six Ps are paresis leading to paralysis, paresthesia leading to anesthesia, pulses and pink color present, pain and pain with stretch, but that goes away once you get anesthesia, and then pressure. Now pressure is the first thing you must have to get a compartment syndrome. It's the earliest finding. And so therefore, that's why we got into pressure measurement. And there, there are tests, the needle tests, will go way back to the 1800s, and Whitesides popular popularized it in our country in the 70s. But I found it very difficult to use and very inaccurate. So about 38 years ago, after I was exposed to my first compartment syndrome, I went around and found uh, in our uh, university the Wick catheter that had been developed by Scholander and Hargens. And Hargens at that time was a, was a PhD uh, graduate, recent graduate, and he helped uh, me put together the, the clinical WIC catheter. And the purpose of the WIC, which was a piece of uh, suture that was pulled in the end of the catheter, and then the catheter is filled with fluid, was to uh, spread the surface tension so that the inter 
uh, muscular fluid was in continuity of the fluid in your tube, and then it went to a pressure transducer and recorder. And it works very well. It's a little nuisance to make, and so um, we, we changed it, and I'll go back to that in a second. Now, Hargens and others and Scholander were using it to study pressure in turtles and penguins in Antarctica and crocodiles and bow constrictors. Uh, he was trying to figure out the big lizards like this. They were just measuring pressures in everything. Uh, they studied salmon to figure out why they died when they went upstream and they get edema uh, from changing from salt water to fresh water and that's why they die. And so we, this is the Wick catheter and Cecil Rohrbeck who I've worked with uh, out of London, Ontario in Canada uh, thought that this was uh, difficult so he decided to pull the wick out and make some slits and together we figured out that if you have five slits about three to four millimeters in length this works just as well as the wick in increasing your surface area and it's a lot easier to manufacture. Now then what do you hook it up to? Well we have the little pressure transducer and recording devices which we use but probably the easiest that I find is a hookup to an arterial line setup that uh, your anesthesiology tech does every day, every case uh, for the anesthesiologists, at least in our hospital. And so I just have them set it up with a pressure transducer, usually to CVP range, which is zero to 100 millimeters, which will be a good range for you for measuring pressure. And then you put on, you put the, the pressure to gauge into the muscle using a, a slit catheter. So CVP arterial line set up just ask them to set it up and you'll do the rest. And then you can use a slit catheter. If you don't have one of those, you can use the epidural catheter, which has multiple little holes in it, and that works pretty well with a needle to introduce it. So those are both uh, options. Before you put it in, though, you need to check to see that uh, you have a fluid column that registers correctly on your recording device. And you see you need to raise and lower this to see if you see the needle jump just for the hydrostatic pressure of your, of your fluid column in your uh, pressure transducer system. And then you have to have your pressure transducer at the same level as the, where you're sticking it into the, to the leg or the arm. Um, there are many little uh, devices that have come about. Uh, some of them are fairly good and some are pretty inaccurate and, and mistakes can occur. So I'd like to use the professional equipment, the anesthesiologists, rather than the toys that are out there for orthopedists. And our injury uh, of a nerve, the artery, uh, and a compartment syndrome, you're trying to sort it out. Relative indications is just to kind of kick you in the butt and say, let's go, you got one. Uh, don't waste time to monitor a patient on the ward or to, to figure out whether you've adequately decompressed the compartment at the time of surgery. Because you can limit some of your skin incision if you have pressure monitoring. And I also use it when I close up uh, so to be very careful that, uh, that I'm not uh, over tightening or trying too hard to get the skin closed at a week later. Normal muscle pressure is about four millimeters of mercury. But, and the threshold for doing surgery in our hands is around 30 millimeters of mercury. Others use a delta P relative to diastolic. Some use it relative to systolic. So the answer isn't clear. We like the 30 millimeters because it's a pretty simple number and orthopedists like simple things to remember to know when to do something. Plus we studied it in animals, uh, dogs, that so we raised the pressure to 30 millimeters of mercury for about eight hours and you start getting muscle necrosis and you start getting nerve death. Now, if you have 50 millimeters of mercury for eight hours, you'll have a lot of muscle death. But it's, it's both a, a relationship of the pressure and the time. Now, we, we can measure the pressure, but we don't know the time when the compartment syndrome got there, when the pressure came to, got to ischemic levels, unless you've been monitoring the patient. You may know when the trauma started, but you don't really know, in most cases, when the pressure got to that bad, that bad level. And, and so, therefore, measure the pressure. If the pressure is high, decompress it. I've decompressed uh, limbs at two, di two days post-injury because they didn't know when it started and, and they had neurologic symptoms, the nerves are out, and we've got it back. You may not always win, but sometimes you can, and that's a big win. So here's just a schematic showing what happens. Well, this, when the pressure gets to 30, it shuts down these little arterioles and capillaries in your compartment. Now, there are other factors. Obviously, it's the patient factors, the clinical findings of the patient, we, we want to see those findings before we do something. Don't just react on the pressure alone unless they're under anesthesia. What's their blood pressure? What's the trends of the symptoms and signs? What's the cooperation of the patient? If you've got a good patient, you can examine and wait for findings to occur. It's okay to watch them for a little bit as long as you're a good examiner of, of those neurologic findings. 
Other factors are the pressure trends, are they going up or down, the nature of the trauma, the time from injury, and other injuries, and then time of day. And I use the example of a, of a patient, a good cooperative adult who's, who's got a tibia fracture, the nerves are kind of going out, you measure the pressure, it's 25, do you do the fasciotomy, do you watch? Well, you can watch, but if it's uh, kind of the same pressure at 10 o'clock at night, you may not be so anxious to watch that patient and you'll probably go to surgery and do it. So 30 is just a relative indication, but be safe, not sorry. What's your differential diagnosis when you have a patient with a swollen limb like this, pain, numbness, weakness? Well, it's just three things. So it's a very short list. Arterial injury, compartment syndrome, and neuropathy. Usually a, a neuropraxia from the, from the injury of the, of the fracture. There are other odds and ends, but those, that's basically the, the, the three. But the treatment for these is totally different. Arterial injury, you've got to fix it right away or the limb's going to die. Compartment syndrome, we've got to fix it right away or the limb's going to die, or at least the muscle and the nerves. The neuropathy associated with a closed fracture, you wait and watch three to four months to see what happens. So you can't assume that your perineal nerve injury from your tibia fracture, you note the next morning, is due to the trauma that you didn't see the day before. It could be the dreaded compartment syndrome, and you've got to react appropriately. And the clinical findings overlap a lot. They all have pain, paresis, and paresthesia. Now, a routine, tibia fra a routine neuro uh, neuropathy may not be associated with much pain, but it's usually associated with a fracture. So they, it's hard to sort out whether the pain from your perineal nerve injury is due to the ischemia or due to the tibia fracture. Compartment syndrome only is the only one that has increased pressure, so measuring pressure helps you there, at least feeling the limb. If you don't have a tight a compartment, you probably don't have a compartment syndrome. And usually the pulses are out when you've got an arterial injury, but everybody knows you can have an aneurysm or a, adequate collaterals so that you can have some pulses. So it, you may need arteriography, a Doppler, and all those factors that help you. Treatment. Well, we like uh, to start with when you see a patient on the ward or even postoperatively, particularly with fiberglass casts, you, you need to spread the cast and put a little spreader in there to, to, to relieve the tension. We've studied casts and the effects of casts on, on limbs after trauma, and certainly they can be an added factor, an added envelope around your limb that decreases the spread of the limb and the volume that you have. So uh, univalving, bivalving helps. Uh, we univalve all our, our uh, limb surgeries afterwards uh, so that we are ready to uh, widen it more if we need to uh, and don't have to worry on the ward to try to cut the cast uh, in the middle of the night. If you come around on the ward, and I train our residents as you walk around, you check them twice a day. You turn off the television when they're, that they're watching, you have them wiggle their toes up and down, you test their sensation so that you're there every 12 hours to check them. And if you have a deficit, you need to explain it. You don't hope that it's a perineal nerve palsy. And, and if it's not better after you've spread the cast, you bivalve the cast, you take it off and look to see, is, do you have a tense compartment or something else going on? You can't guess, you can't wait till the morning to see if it's better. How do you decompress it? There are many different procedures. When Rick Gilberman was in San Diego, uh, he and I worked on the different techniques for doing forearm decompression, and like the Henry approach to the forearm, which gives you access to the mobile wad and the volar compartment and all the way down to the carpal canal if you need to. And then you have to make a second incision posteriorly for the dorsal compartment. But we always measure the pressure. Sometimes you don't, after you release the boulder, you don't have to do the, the, the dorsal compartment. Same is true on the leg. You don't have to release all of them because once you relieve the tension in the major ones, the others may come down into normal range. Take care of the fracture. Fix the fracture. Get it out of the way because you're going to have enough to deal with with the soft tissue injuries. And so we, we uh, will plate the, or rod the, the forearms. The leg, I use the double incision technique, which we described years ago, because it's easy surgery. It's an easy operation. It's, it's, it, once you know your anatomy, one incision is on the anterolateral side, halfway between the tibia crest and the fibula, and you make the incision there, and then you go down and identify the septum that lies right between the anterior and lateral compartment. You need to find that septum because with the pressure high in one or the other two compart the, those compartments, that septum could be moved. And it, if you have a high pressure in the anterior, that septum could be pushed, that, or that compartment pressure will push the septum posteriorly. So you need to identify it. Be, 
so that you be sure that you've uh, decompressed both of those compartments. And watch out for the superficial perineal nerve because it lies right there underneath the uh, fascia often uh, right at the septum in the lateral compartment. And then you orient your scissors and the, you make a big enough incision that make, make sure that you've decompressed it adequately. And, and you slide the scissors towards the patella and distally towards the great toe. And then you go in the lateral compartment, head towards the fibular head and to the lateral malleolus as pictured. And then the superficial and deep posterior compartments are approached through a posterior medial incision. And looking at that in detail, you again need to find the septum between the superficial and deep posterior compartment. Sometimes the soleus bridge hides the deep posterior compartment, so you need a lift off part of it. And then again, you release it approximately and distally as shown. And it's pretty straightforward. It's about a 10 minute operation. You could do it on the ward on a really sick patient if you have to, and you can't move them. Uh, and uh, and it's, the hard part is making the decision to do it. And so what about the tibia when you have a fracture? Well, again, we've looked at that. We've looked at some that we had treated closed. We've looked at some we treated with X-fix. We looked at some that we had uh, fixed internally. And we find that the functional results were much better when you take care of the bone uh, and handle that. Because you're, again, going to have fasciotomy wounds to deal with. And you might as well have the, the tibia component out of the way that makes wound care easier and function better in the long run and improves, of course, the anatomic result. Uh, if you have the tibia fixed and you can ha now handle those ischemic tissues. And infection, of course, is possible because you're going to have an open injury. And here's a 12-year-old boy, soccer injury, had a little uh, green stick type crack with a little angulation of his, of his tibia, but his pressures were real high, anterior and lateral compartment. He ended up with a decompression there and, and flexed nails to stabilize his tibia. And then postoperatively, uh, we, we bring them back every three or so days to work on their wound, uh, try to close it as much on the ends, measure pressure if you, if you think you're getting too tight. Uh, and, and if you, you're there early in the forearm, you can shrink the size of your skin graft and the legs. Sometimes you can close it all if you bring them back every three to four days routinely uh, for a couple weeks. Now, you can't do that if you're late. If you're late, you've got to go real slow because you've got to debris things. And, uh, and you don't want to close or even skin graft it until you got all the dead muscle out of the way. And then you start therapy. Wound vacs are very helpful to uh, de shrink that and keep the swelling down and decrease the size of your wounds. But remember, a lot of the children haven't read the book on what the symptoms are. And you're going to see a whole variety of kids come in with different sequences and different problems. And then to conclude, I want to go through a, a few iatrogenic compartment syndromes that in the last 10 years we've uh, seen and written about and tried to get a better understanding. The first group that we've seen because of the prevalence of doing uh, flex nails on kids is uh, problems with compartment syndrome at our own institution. And this is the paper in 04. We looked at our results and we, we had an incidence of 7.5% compartment syndromes and they were all in the group that we operated on. We had 205 treated by closed reduction. None had a compartment syndrome. Now, obviously, the trauma is worse and so on and so forth, so they aren't comparable groups. But we looked at what was going on a little more. And a lot of it was the fact that we, some of the times the president of staff had used a tourniquet. But I think the major thing was they were trying too hard to slide their nails in and re without opening the fracture site and they they you know it was a disgrace to not to open the fracture site to get the nails across or pass so they would re-manipulate the fracture pass and miss pass and miss and uh and then as soon as they concluded sometimes just in the recovery room the limb was a balloon and they had to take them right back now none of them had a bad result but they all had to have fasciotomies because they were all recognized early and like I said, within the first 12 hours. So I, we, I have a rule that three misses with your, your nail, make a little incision and help it across the fracture site uh, rather than just keep brutalizing the muscles. We are now coming up with a paper that's going to be presented at the academy. We looked at our tibia rods. Now these were closed tibias and some were minor open ones that we found 20% incidence again of compartment syndromes. And looking at that patient population, they were tend to be bigger kids, more comminuted tibias, and uh, some of them had uh, a little bit of neurologic loss to begin with, nothing like a definite compartment syndrome, but were probably on the brink with some basic pressure. And then pulling them out the length 
putting the rods in, that tipped them over the course. We didn't find that there was longer uh, radiology uh, image time or anything like that, but there may be a factor there. Um, what about the hemilithotomy position? That's been associated in orthopedics as well as in GYN and uh, urology surgery is having a problem with compartment syndrome in the up leg, the, sometimes the normal leg, uh, often the normal leg, or often these are normal legs. And what caused it? Well, first of all, they were all long cases where it was up there for three or four hours. So we took some normal volunteers, some college students that wanted to have WIC catheters placed in their legs, and we hooked them up. Uh, they, they were awake. We didn't give them a general anesthetic, so that's another factor. Um, and we looked, uh, and we measured their, their blood pressure in their down leg. It was 60 millimeters of mercury average. And as soon as you lifted them up into the sling, it dropped to 30 millimeters of mercury. So elevation that's too high decreases your pressure gradient. 30 millimeters, just like that. And then if you measure the pressure in the down leg, it was zero. But the, because of the weight of the leg on the sling, the pressure in the anterior and posterior compartments was around 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury, just from the weight of the leg pushing on the sling. So you have an arterial pressure in that leg of 30 and a compartment pressure of 25. That gives you a delta gradient of a 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury <clears throat> on an awake patient. That patient is, is, has hypotension from the femur fracture and is under anesthesia that's going to reverse that. You're going to have more pressure than you have blood pressure going to the limb. So that's why it happens. So you can't, uh, you can't leave that limb up there three or four hours. You need to take it down every couple hours if that's your technique uh, that you're doing. And maybe consider a different technique of, of doing, fixing your, your limb uh, on the opposite side. Usually you're fixing a fracture on the opposite side, such as a lateral decuse or a scissor type of position. Next thing is the spica cast we looked at. Um, and this really started because I had two different lawsuits sitting on my desk that I finally got around to reviewing. They were from two different parts of our country. And lo and behold, they were exactly the same etiology, exactly the same type skin problems. And uh, Steve Frick had written a little paper on it, but really didn't have all the details that I had with these two. And we then joined forces with some of our former fellows and they had cases that they had seen, and uh, these are examples. This is a three and a half year old boy who had this little spiral fracture, crashed his bicycle, not much trauma. You could, you could handle this femur fracture uh, relatively easy with any kind of treatment. He was reduced under ketamine uh, by this technique where he pulled, they put a short leg cast on it because that was a popular technique, and then they pulled on the limb and put him in a spike of cast, and these are his films. And then he was sent home after a little check. Uh, two weeks later, they took him out of his cast. He had motor sensory deficit, large skin losses on his legs, uh, and posterior calf with muscle necrosis. Here's, and his femur healed pretty nicely. Uh, but this is what his limb looked like and his calf. And here's a two-year-old who had a similar thing, a nothing-type spiral fracture, had the 90-90 traction cast placed in the OR, was even watched in the hospital 12 days later. Uh, swelling, the spica off, necrosis of the skin here, and uh, contracture of the toes, and these, and they clawed up. And overall, we found nine children, all average age was three and a half at the time, mostly male, all male, uh, except one, and they were all treated with a 90-90 cast, with the short leg cast being applied first. This technique came out in 1986 with just as a technique paper, no, no, no uh, patients included, where they put a little cylinder on there and, and one on the trunk and then they would pull on it and then plaster in the cast in between. Well, looking at the, what happens, I think uh, you can see by, based on the pathology and what's, what's happening when they go under anesthesia, you put the short leg cast on with or without the trunk portion, then they're pulling on this short leg cast and then you fill in the rest of the plaster so the femur fracture is kind of distracted. Then they wake up after the anesthesia is completed and there's a tendency now for this, the muscle and so on to pull the, the leg back into the spike of cast and I've illustrated showing the toes slightly disappearing there. That causes the knee to go around the corner here and the foot to slide in to get pressure points at the popliteal fossa area and over the anterior ankle. Now, a club foot cast that we've all treated and had slide off, 
you will often see a little red spot, sometimes full necrosis on the dorsum of the foot. Certainly, uh, I've had it happen. Uh, my, my fellow took this x-ray and one that came to the emergency room, fortunately, so I can use it in my talk, lo and behold. Uh, and he, this child had pressure points right here and right there. Fortunately, no necrosis because it, it happened soon and it was recognized the toes had disappeared. So it's the same mechanism. In this case, the, the cast is sliding off. In the other case, the leg is sliding into the spica. And that's why you get all these skin problems. They all have them in this series. And you get the calf pressure sores, sometimes very, very extensive. So don't use this traction with a short leg cast and stay away from the 90-90s you already showed you, decreases your pulse pressure in your leg. And use something a little more, uh, less uh, uh, aggressive. And, uh, and we kind of just put this little paper together with that one to show how to do it. You can pull on the leg, that's fine, as long as there's not a cast on it, and pull it out to length as you put on your spica with your padding three-point mold, get your x-rays, decide if you like it. I was going to debate on this. I still think a spike of cast for a kid under five is a good thing. Uh, it's very simple and safe. And then you can add the leg portions, trim out the abdomen, uh, and pre please prevent compartment syndrome. This was the worst case, this child. He lost everything in his leg. This is the one in the series. So how did I get interested in compartment syndromes? Well, it, it really happened about 40 years ago. I was a first year resident, and of course, first year residents get stuck with uh, bad times to be on call. And I got stuck on Christmas Eve to be on call. Um, but they, that was fortunate. That's what I looked like at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ralph the burglar came in as a patient uh, uh, for me to see. And he uh, came in with very, very tense, swollen forearms. And this, these are his forearms. They don't look impressive. They weren't very swollen looking. But when you touched them, they were rock hard. And I didn't know much about that. He was hypotensive. They were really, really tight. Motor and sensory totally out on both sides in his hand. Pulses intact. And um, he had a CPK initially of 78,000. It went up to 172,000. He had brown urine without RBCs, which is myoglobinuria, and his creatinine was 2.8. So we ended up doing forearm fasciotomies bilaterally about two and a half hours after admission, and his motor function came back. We had to do skin graftings uh, later, but we got it all back uh, and saved this thing. And that got me interested in compartment syndromes because we didn't have any pressure measurement. We didn't, I didn't know much about it. Or, Staff didn't know much about it, and, uh, and certainly uh, we, we got into, that's how I got interested in, in pressure measurement. But how did this happen? Well, remember, this was Christmas Eve, and uh, this is where it happened. This is one of our, our uh, lesser-known places, the dollhouse, <laughs> where you can go to watch the Go-Go Girls. I don't know if they have any such place like that in India. But this was Christmas Eve, so it was late. Everything's closed up. Ralph uh, came here, the door was locked, he couldn't get in to rob the place, so he went around the back side of the dollhouse, found an old ladder, climbed on the roof, and then decided to pretend he was Santa Claus, and, uh, and opened up one of these vents here to climb down inside to get to rob the place, and got stuck in the vent. <laughs> and uh, this is Ralph, at the, you can start to see the top of his head, and these guys are the police, because he, they, they, uh, he's screamed after being stuck there for a number of hours. Uh, they were the rescue force. There's Ralph inside. His hands were actually supporting him inside this uh, air vent. And, and, and that's how he was jammed up there. And this is what he looked like from the inside. You can see the Christmas decorations. So that's how it started. And there's Ralph. Uh, so now you know the rest of the story. Thank you. The Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India honors Dr. Scott J. Mubarak, Clinical Professor, Department of Orthopedics, University of California, and Director, Orthopedic Institute at Radi Children's Hospital, San Diego, for delivering the fourth posi oration on 14 January 2012 at the 18th Annual Meeting held at Pune. 
May I request people to be seated?